Global TM movement. Professor Passat also served as a minority leader in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, chairman of the Board of Governors of the National Institute of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology, a commissioner of the Port Authority, and a member of the Cabinet Appointed Committee on the Evaluation of Textbooks. Professor Passat has consulted and done trading courses for industry and business in Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago, and is a licensed Hindu marriage officer, spiritual leader, and a director of Saha Incorporation, and also a first degree black belt from Japan Karate yeah. Association. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Passad has been actively involved in researching an artificial intelligence for the past 25 years at both UV and UTT, and has supervised, of course, many PhDs and MPhil in this area. Please welcome me to welcome, please join me to welcome Professor Passad to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it should stay there. That will you stay there. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. After I will not tell me, Madam Chairperson, I'm so for your kind introduction. After that lengthy bio by Chami, people might think I'm suffering from the short man complex. <laughs> uh, but thank you for your kind comments. And I can assure you, I haven't transcended the world as yet. I'm still here. So I haven't transcended that quite yet. Uh, afternoon to all, it is my pleasure to give this small talk on AI. Now, there are several publications on AI, on the state of AI, including this special time edition for everybody, for general reading, and artificial intelligence, a special issue by A360 Media. It's meant for everybody. It gives a very, very detailed um, status of what the applications are, what are likely applications. Um, so I will um, regurgitate that. Makes no sense. This is going to be done easily. You can get it easily either in hard copies or online. The intention here really is to present a viewpoint. AI, having been a researcher, and still I'm a researcher in AI. So I'm looking at some of the possible applications locally and regionally, and the status of the progress or lack thereof in Toronto with regard to AI applications. Uh, it's not a, uh, this is an academic institution, I, I'm not into politics. I'm speaking you know, as an academic. Uh, let's look at some basic definitions. Now, intelligence as defined, and there are many definitions to intelligence. One that is generally used is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Now, knowledge you know, is quite defined. Skills a bit more nebulous to define in terms of you know, equations or formula, et cetera. Now, is, Intelligence is unidimensional. So when you say somebody's intelligent, what does that mean? Are they like God, super intelligent? What, you know, what are they? So intelligence is, is not unidimensional. There are various examples of general intelligence. So, you know, in, 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 just like general intelligence, which has not yet been defined, or what we call common sense. In fact, there was a famous, in the 1990s, uh, a database in Stanford. Over 10 million rules, I believe, you could you know, diagnose the most complicated, obscure disease. But it couldn't tell you whether you're living or dead. It was better than most doctors. So that's common sense. Right? So that, that, that's what we call now you know, uh, artificial general intelligence or general artif uh, artificial intelligence in terms of using the interchangeably. There is emotional intelligence. We know that we have people who are very bright and go out to work and they can't work with, you know, can't deal with people, can't interact with people. That's intelligence also. So you have a whole variety of intelligence. To put it in perspective further, when you look at modern intelligence tests, they focus on mathematical skills, 
We focus on memory, and memory is important. Spatial perception and language abilities, which includes culture a bit. If you look at any standard AI test, these are things will be in it. So it tests a very limited range. It doesn't really go through the, all the sort of um, intelligences that they are. Now, when we speak of AI, we need to understand which types of intelligence we are considering. And therefore, it will determine the applications or possible applications for it. Now, I use this example why cockroaches are intelligent. Now, it's not meant to be, you know, bad or to throw things off. But why do we, if we're intelligent and we can use knowledge and skills, why do we do that? It's to get a job, to be able to live, to survive. It's not so. So the, the, the premise of intelligence, use of it, is to survive. Now, cockroaches are some of the most successful survivors in the world. Eh? They have been ever since. You ever try killing cockroaches in your house? I get rid of it. You can't. Right? So they know how to survive. So that is a kind of, like I said, the basis of intelligence is survival. So when we talk about AI, we exclude the cockroaches. <laughs> I don't mean to be funny, but we need to understand that. So AI systems con concentrate on computational type aspects of intelligence. So you see, it's very limited, computational type aspects of intelligence. So AI looks at the machine's ability to perform the cognitive functions we associate with human minds. And that is normal human minds. Eh? We have all sorts of humans. Eh? So normal human minds. We educated human minds, if you wish. So the requirements for AI systems include digitized data. And we'll come back to this when I make some comments at the end to understand that. So let's look at digitized data. How much data do we have here in Trinidad? For instance, CSO data is digitized. Health systems, this is probably digitized as well. You, you, you know, the, the um, car, the license office, this is data digitized. Can we, the basis of any sort of application for AI, you must have digitized data. If you do not have digitized data, how can you apply AI? And therefore, that is something that we need to understand. Now, I know there's a ministry of digitalization, and I know they're working hard. But whether we can overcome the backlog and when we can so do, that will determine whether we and how much AI we can use. Right? Now, huge amount of data sets. Now, again, digitalized data sets. Now, you know when we do an email here, we send an email for instance, it goes to Miami, generally speaking, and come back here. We don't have many data centers here, if any at all. So how do we have access to data sets? To train AI, you need data, large amounts of data. You must have access to large amounts of data. So this is a rhetorical question. Do we have large amounts of data in any field? So this again will determine what applications of AI that we can you know, get engaged and use. And this is important. Trinidad is a small country, and I'm speaking from the perspective of Trinidad and the region. Once you say Trinidad, Trinidad is the most advanced technologically, so it applies for the rest of the region also. How can we do, you know, what, what can we do? We must have, we cannot do everything. We must find a niche area, and to do so in AI, we must have the data and, digital, and digitized data to act on it. Now, special algorithms and techniques. I remember back, Way back, I was in Manhattan and I went to a bookstore, I think in 1989 or so. And I, I saw this book on neural networks. Very expensive book. I bought it, a blue covered book, I still have it. And then we started looking at neural networks at UWI. Started to develop simple neural networks. And I'll come to that in a short while. So you need to have this sort of, um, you know, specialized algorithms um, um, and mathematical foundation. Now again, AI is based on really mathematics. And eh? uh, this is something I have pointed out over and over that in this part of the world, we do not do enough mathematics to do research, pure or applied. That's the basis of research, mathematics. Now that position clearly is not very popular. So it's, it's not changing. But that is something we need to recognize, move forward. Now things like fuzzy logic, again, I did buy a book on fuzzy logic some time ago with fuzzy tech. 
when we started looking at fuzzy logic. So neural networks really, it's modeled after the brain neurons. But the neurons, you then drive your axons and you build networks. Like it's trying to simulate the brain, how the brain functions. So and this is this is a, a common thread of AI. We're trying to imitate, simulate whatever term you want to use, how the brain works, how the human mind works. So that so neural networks like that. So you build networks and it gets more and more complex. Now there's in you know various layers of these neurons. And this is why when you have so many layers, we call it many layers, nobody know how to know, will know how it works really. So after a time. When you see these things happen, and people are saying that now, they're not too sure why they're getting the results. Unless they want to spend, you know, thousands of hours looking at all the inputs in each iteration in the network. And it's a very iterative process, right? So this is something you have to look at again. Now, fuzzy logic is if then rules. So you see, you know, that's how we make decisions. If the speaker is born, you fall asleep. If so and so, right? So what I'm saying is if the speaker is boring and we don't want them to feel bad, we try to keep awake. So you have all these rules. If they rules, that's fuzzy logic. Now, there's nothing fuzzy about fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is really multi-state logic. The books, um, the, the, you know, the originator of it in the Western world, but well, actually from Turkey, but it was in the West, says it's, it's, it's really based start on logic that started by Lord Buddha. That you know things are not black and white. In fact, if you look at any book on logic, it says there's excluded middle. But there are many states of logic, or to put it in a simple language, and there are many states of gray. Well, let's say 50 states of gray, I'm sure there's more than 50. Mm -hmm. But it explains the situation that you know things are not really black and white all the time. We have many shades of gray. And now we have color thrown in between. But anyway, so fuzzy logic is a mathematical tool. Again, it's very you know sophisticated. Now, large language models that we need to, if you need to interpret things. Language model, you can, any word, you can actually build a series of matrices with it for its explanations, et cetera, right? This research started in MIT. There's a language professor there whose name slipped me at this moment, but he started this sort of work on, you know, looking at language as a tool. In terms of simple language, we all know language as grammar. We know mathematics as calculus. What does calculus mean? Calculus means a set of rules. What is grammar? A set of rules. It's not so. You have rules. I cannot say I is this. The rule is I am. So it's, it's, you know these rules are there. So it's very similar. As unfortunately we seem to think that language is different from mathematics, whereas mathematics, in fact, is a very precise language. And I, I like to give the example. You know that imagine. You're speaking to a highfalutin New York, New Yorker who came out for carnival. And so I'm going for a lime. The New Yorker will sure think that you're going to the market to buy a lime. This is not so. Whereas, you know, the, it means something different. The context, etc., or the local language balance. Mathematics, you say, I'm going to integrate X, you integrate an X. There, there, there is no, um, you know, different meaning to it. So it's very precise. So large language models are used in generative AI a lot to put answers. And then you need significant computing resources. Significant, very, very significant. And to put that in context, the human brain can do about one mathematical calculation per second. But someone will take hour, depends on how much the truth, right? <laughs> but never mind. But supercomputers can do 1.1 billion billion operations per second at this point in time. And it's getting faster and faster. So what you need is such supercomputers. Now we have none in this part of the world as far as I know. And actually for those of you who want to build one, if you look at Gaben computers, they're very, very fast. Eh? By putting a network of Gaben computers, you can actually build supercomputers. And some people do that. Actually way back in Omera campus, we had a member staff, we were trying to do that. But he left. So we didn't have any. So this is something that, you know, so you need computing resources. So for AI to, you know, to, to uh, excel or to be used, you really need, um, you know, logic procedures, clear logic procedures, and extensive, you know, computing power. Now, AI systems are specialized. 
Uh, we talk, you know, in terms of um, general artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, that is something that's more complex. That needs to look at, you need to look at various languages, various expert systems, various sort of domains. And to give an you know, example of that, eh? um, when you look at, if you want to, AI, like I say, is very specialized, and like chat GPT, which you come to in a short while, can give special answers, a whole set of different you know, software. Chat, chat GPT uses large language models, yeah? But for it to be across general intelligence, so let me ask you if you could get this, right? If, if an AI system can do this. In Hindi, the word for cow is guy, guy. This fellow from India, his parents went to the USA in Texas, and he was going to school there. And the teacher patterns back, so how are you going, big guy? <laughs> he went home crying. <laughs> Told his father teacher, come a big fat cow. <laughs> <laughs> now for AI to make this sort of linkages across different languages and different cultures. That is something like more like general intelligence. Or you know, to be a comedian, you have to be very smart and Really, really smart. Look at this late night show, fellas. So AI has to be just say so very specific knowledge that you can calculate these sort of things. AI is good at that. So don't ask Chat GPT for any good joke. I mean, my grandson who marks um, Alexa <laughs> give jokes, very, very boring jokes, yeah, but <laughs> and, and that multicultural jokes see that that's a big area, multicultural jokes. It's a huge area, human area. So that tells you the kind of natural intelligence I have, right? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on. Um, no, so games like chess. Go is a Chinese game. It's supposed to be the most complicated game in the world. But these have real rules. I don't, you know, you can identify the rules. And a good chess man looks at 10 um, or more steps ahead. But all that calculated. So it can do that. Like Deep Blue, the IBM computer that being the chess champion. Because the rules were programmed in. Yeah. They had one with go that I think they played a few matches. The computer won one and the, 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 the guy won a few more. The person, I'm not used guy. Medical diagnostics. And this has been used big time now, right? The, the rules as you go in the not here apparently, is it? But you know, it, it state of the art, you know, clinics, etc. Pattern recognition, this is something that's been that has been used of for a variety of applications, more and more when you look at patterns, right? Um, pattern recognition includes facial recognition, all right? Things like gauge analysis, you know, everybody walk differently, you know? I remember when you look at cricket, you couldn't see Chandra Paul's face, but when you see him walk, you know, that's Chandra Paul. So people, everybody walk differently and they, they use that for gait analysis to identify people, okay? Because really biomechanics are his movement. So a variety of these sort of things that exist applications of AI. Then language in um, interpretation and model, chat GPT. Now this is trained on enormous amounts of data available on databases obtained from the internet. That's the thing of people, you have people who talk the truth in the internet, internet, people talk the partial truth, and people make outright lies and malicious other things on the internet. But all these things go into a database. So imagine you come to a classroom, but the teacher ain't always telling you. How do you learn? Well, you know half of what he's telling you. So you, you've been trained on data that is not quite you know, accurate. So this is the problem you have right now with these sort of things, right? So chat GPT, you know, like I say, I use it. I use chat GPT Messenger. It's more or less the same thing. So I ask you, tell me the state of um, applications of AI. I got a prompt answer in all the various fields. And I said, tell me the state of application of AI in Trinidad. You see this nascent. And tell me all the fields again. So the, what I'm saying, so the answers you get from it, you're not too sure exactly how this it depends on what is on the uh, on the data pieces through the internet, right? Now let's look specifically at AI in education. Chat GPT in particular has caused a great stir in this, in this you know, sector. You hear about people cheating, etc. Students cheating, but students have always used that mechanism from way back. And they find more and more ways of doing it. Right? 
Um, in some countries, is a, is a enormous task when the students go into examination room, how to deal with it. Even here, we have to walk with them to the toilet and if they stay too long, they what they're doing is so long to make sure they have it. You know what I'm saying? So that is, you know, that, that is a sign of intelligence also, how, how, how they can beat the system. Eh? So, so let's look at that really seriously. Now, AI is also used in writing research papers. Let's put that in some perspective. Students at SCA here memorize 30 to 40 essays to write the, the SCA exam. Is that cheating or not? You can, you can don't have the answer, you, you'll be taken up on the mic. You decide, all right? At CXC and K, students learn solutions because you know, these, these problems are repeated at university level. When I did my final year um, in exams in control systems in the last century, I didn't know that the, the student the, uh, paper should be repeated. All my colleagues knew that. They went to the library and got all the answers and they did well. I didn't do too bad myself, but, but these are things, you know, so you have, uh, is that cheating or not? For a fee, people write a thesis for you. Is that so? Is that cheating or not? Right. Now, people use chat GPT now, and they should know that. And I was speaking to my colleague, my distinguished colleagues from the MME, that they pointed that out. That you know the, the technical thing is hallucinate. It lies. It makes up answers. It does all sorts of things. So even if you use it, you have to check what it says. Because like I say, with, with the chat GPT messenger told me all these applications in general, which will come to you see whether it's there or not. So you have to so in any event, <clears throat> when you use this chat GPT. You have to actually check it so your students do some work actually, yeah? so it's not bad, but actually have to read and check it, you know. So is that so we have to look at it, you know, in terms of that. Yeah? Now there's the, the Google for uh, equivalent of chat GPT is Gemini, Gemini or Gemini, depends on pronunciation. Now the latest news is that the head of Google might lose his job for their calls for that, because somebody in the asks, um, Gemini about the Prime Minister. And it had very unflattering things to say about the Prime Minister. That came from sort of a, what, what they call him, left, you know, whatever, you know. So people say all sorts of things, eh? and it takes up all that. But it's true or not. So the, Google has some um, problems in India now because so, nobody, you know, sort of vetted all these sort of things. And this is a problem we face with AI. You know, with AI, with, when somebody wanted to advertise or put it to Pope, in a nice um, jacket, or well, the fake, you know, the fake, fake, um, the fake as a column now in terms of information, in terms of pictures, etc. So these are sort of things that you need to look at. So, but anyway, so what we said, if you if you use AI software, you still need to know what you're supposed to do. So maybe using AI software and students not checking, then we can be sure they don't know what they know or what they should know. Because they didn't check, I didn't correct. So maybe it's, it's not that bad in terms of there's some good uses for it. In terms of research papers, if you use chat GPT, you must indicate that you can use that. That's how it is. Now, so what I, what I, I my view is this, eh, that we have to look at AI really is extending the tools. Remember this thing here, the calculator? No. Okay, when I did my final exams last century, we used slide rule. <laughs> I don't I know how many people have ever seen a slide rule. Or must just use one. That's what we use. Yeah? Then the calculators, right? Do you remember the Cambridge Elementary mathematical tables? That, that, that's a, that should be in a museum. This <laughs> one we should use. Yeah? Nobody uses that now, right? Or you know, the geometry set. Right? You have to use now, you, you, you can do all the drawings in the computer. Or the, you know this sort of um, template for various shapes. Nobody uses that again. So what happens? There's an evolution going upwards, and you know AI really is the next evolution that we can use AI, but use it effectively. It, it has great value for us. Therefore, the 
question that arises would be this. Now that we have information at the fingertip, we have tools to analyze information. Should we still go through education the same way? Should we not change the paradigm for education? How we teach, how we teach students? That we should be, at least my view, right or wrong, we should be more based on problem solving. How can we solve problems, teach them how to solve problems, and then how to access information to solve the problem. That's what education should be. No. Otherwise, we'll be left further behind. But anyway, that is not for me to decide. I think this is something you know, you know, society must think about. Now, let's come briefly to industry. And we say no, no industry is immune, right, from fashion. You see some places now you can actually wear your things and change your clothes and different glasses, etc. All AI-based software. Engineering the medicine, right? They're looking at you're looking at DNA. And in fact, they're looking now because of the amount of data needs for, for AI, looking at how the DNA stores, how people store the various amount of data and DNA look at that sort of model. For media, like we talk about defake and people writing all these things, and you can see the American elections, what's happening with AI and you know malicious um, you know information, etc. Um, finance, the criminal enterprise. Right, the criminals are using, waiting to use AI more and more, and they've started it already. So it's every, just like a tool, right? And would you believe also spirituality also? I mean, astrology, <laughs> these sort of things, people can use it also. And some, some of these uh, religious guys are very, very forward with the technology, you know. Let's be out of mind. So it is being used in just about every endeavor of humanity. Industry, everything, you know, like I say, all types. So, how do you deal with it? As the, 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 the applications are turned out very, very fast. Eh? So the issue then is that like every technology, it can be used for good or to the detriment of society. We have to make sure that, I mean, like cars are good, but people use cars to run with the people to kill them. It's, you know, that was not the intention of cars. But it, the usage people, right? So what we're saying is regulations and laws governance usage are absolutely necessary. Now, the tech industry, they have made some attempts, initial attempts to regulate itself. But you know, I, I'm not too sure that tech industry really, when they see the big dollar sign, whether that would not you know, change things. And you look at how software has evolved. Like I say, initially, software, you buy software, you had a dongle, you put it in the back of your computer, and that was your software. Now, when you pay the whole set of money for software, you rent it for one year. You have to like buy it every year. So you think about this, the tech, they make endless money worth over two trillion or whatever. I mean, it's a big business. Eh? So if 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 they, you know, they think that the business is going to be affected by these sort of regulations, they need to look at it. And they might, you know, you know which way it will be there. Eh? So I just thought we would talk briefly about some of the work that we started, uh, the Mechatronics Group. They're here also, they have come from UE to UTT, some of the work, and I, you know, I want to publicly acknowledge, you know, the really, really committed, talented, and brilliant staff from the Mechatronics group, eh, who are, you know, did really good work, eh? And you can determine this, I just highlight a few. Way back we look, in the 90s, we looked at a five-story building in Park Street, Port of Spain. And the problem was facing that if you leave the AC on whole night, the bill goes up very high, because you switch it off in the evening, and start back in the morning. The issue was what time to start it in the morning to ensure that the place was cool. So a student MPhil project spent years of going through the data trillion. Years, eh? I think two or three years. We got a uh, answer, but the company never uses it. They bought a, a commercial system. But we started this AI research then using neural nets. Then uh, Dr. Sangsa is here where she looked at the a decision support system for a glass furnace. A glass furnace is a very complex operation, a non-linear non operation. The, the operators are not staying too often. So how do you train operators in it? So if you looked at data over the over many years to come up with a decision support system that was validated, worked pretty well. But again, I think the problem in this part of the world, or the issue, not the straight problem, is translation from when you do research here, 
good research that makes sense, how does it get in the industry? And the variety of problems, and, and, and that we haven't, we haven't gotten over that as yet. Eh? Similar thing was done, similar sort of using fuzzy logic again for a cement furnace, which again is a non linear operation, the cement factory turned out, and it worked well also. These were validated. Eh? So this is somebody, like I said, we've been doing AI research for quite some time, and it was published also and the thesis, right? But the AI, we talk about big data, but part of AI was in robotics. Intelligent systems, how do robots behave, or intelligent machines as such, which is a different kind of thing. The large amount of data is not there. Smaller data, active decision making, and more trading. So we looked at, um, um, you know, Dr. Sangsa did the, 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 the fuzzy logic for the you know, AI, uh, for the glass furnace and cement. Dr. Biznati actually worked on the tablet play, uh, right, where we looked at can we get a, a, a robot that plays the rhythms, et cetera, right? This was tested in a variety of ways. So we tested against individual player. Most people couldn't tell the difference, right? Um, you, you have the Turing test. People know what the Turing test is? It's a, it's a, some, if you say something is intelligent, you can talk to something. This, this is what the chat box ought to do. And respond to you only if you're speaking to a human being or you're speaking to a robot. So this sort of thing, what we did, we actually, had the robot play, taped it, right? And then asked people, we conducted an experiment in UB, I think 2005, 2006, right? Can you tell the difference? Um, we taped the robot playing for a piece and a human being playing for the similar piece, had both pieces, and asked uh, 100 people, you know, random people, students in UB, can you tell the difference which one is a robot, which one is, is a human being? 75% couldn't tell the difference. Those who knew the difference, we asked them, well, can you tell us how you knew the difference? What, 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 made, what, what you know, gave you that? But we are trying to have, like things fast, right? You like chatting, saying things fast, fast, you know, these sort of things, right? They say that a human player, when you come back to the chorus, they tend to play faster. Unless you have years of training classical music to maintain one speed. That's what they knew. The robot, then have emotions, you know, the robot didn't play faster. <laughs> so th this is how it is. We actually incorporated the band, as you can see there, right, in, in, in a live small band, right? It, but yeah, we did that on the well, 2012. So you see, we've been working this a long time now, eh? right? Um, then we use it also for tr trading singers. This was part of your work also, right? The trained singers, you know, people, modern singers want something to practice with or the bands, use it there. And finally, uh, recently since, uh, com completed PhD projects successfully, we use it to, as a teacher, teacher assistant in the class. Now, if you look at Tabla Plain, the teacher sits in front of the class and the students listen, but you need one to one. In India, it's a traditional that you go one to one. Here, yeah, we're never finished, right? Teacher, and he needs money also. One by one doesn't make much sense. You need a class. This is not so. So when he plays, he gets up to go and so and give individual attention. It's very rare. It's difficult. Now what we did, and this was tested um, with students, one control group being taught by the traditional method by the teacher alone, and the second group being taught by the teacher with the teacher assistant which was the robot. So the robot was playing the rhythms continuously and the students were playing and the teachers walking around to see what they were doing. And the results showed clearly, and we had uh, totally neutral um, examiners, that those who learned from the robot played more consistently, with greater, you know, great, greater, um, I call it again, in terms of rhythm, the speed, everything, they were superior. This was tested in Houston, Texas, the students there, and in India, Delhi. And we found the same evidence everywhere. So this, so this is sort of, uh, we haven't published this as that, we need to publish it. These are things that nobody did so far. Eh? So now we have Mr. Bikram Das here, who, you know, and Dr. Lautan also, whose PhD work is this, Bullet machine. We are trying to get an intelligent bullet machine. 
One, when we started research at UV, the bullet machine should break down every week, like a Trinidadian fast bullet there. <laughs> I won't call names. <laughs> but we, we are trying to develop an intelligent fast bullet machine. And this was tested actively on Trinidad Basman. It's also running, right? Now, if you look at fast bullet, look at, look at the Australian guys. They bowl on one wheel. It's not like some, some other people, they bowl five good balls. No run and then last ball gets six or four. That makes no sense. You have to be consistent, consistent all the time. Now, I don't know how many of you bowl fast or bowl at all, but it, you know, it, 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 <laughs> it's a very difficult, the slightest, you know, off, it goes all sides. It's a very, very difficult act to be consistent. So to train batsmen, you know, we're trying to get, you know, this or the machine, we have finalized the mechanics of it, so then we endow it with the characters of various bowlers. Yeah? Uh, this is important because if you look at IPL, or I don't know who doesn't watch the IPL, or the EPL, or the BPL, or whatever, right? That for cricketers, the need, when they go to play cricket, what they do, like England is in India now. So they ask some Indian for the second, um, second class bowlers who didn't make the decision to come and bowl fast for them to practice on. So if they, have, they can't do the left arm bowler, right? They get the left arm, you know, bowler to bowl, they get the idea of it. Eh? But bowling fast, imagine running, jumping and landing your foot, damages your back, your knees, everything. Eh? So to preserve, you know, the, 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 the top bowlers, they, they have these second set bowlers to bowl for batsmen to practice. So this sort of thing has good value. When we started this thing in, in 2006, Ronnie, all the, we had the World Cup in the West Indies there, right? The T20 or the 50 overs, the World yeah. Cup 50, right? And most of the coaches for all the teams came, except for the Pakistan coach who had some reason he couldn't come. They all came and looked at what we were doing. And subsequently, we see somebody, we saw some of Australia start to something similar. So, like I said, a lot of good things emanate from here. We don't carry it forward. That shows by the fact that Trinidadians go all over the world and do well eh? because the opportunities are there for this sort of research and for you to forward. Last one we're involved in, and this is ongoing. I did make a joke and in, in the health service, uh, conference, and I don't think the minister liked it. <laughs> All people liked it too, right? Where we put in, you know, the project name is High and Low Technology in the Health Sector. During the COVID, we're trying to put robots in the health sectors, right? So you, the doctors will be, you know, saved a bit, you know, from fatigue, from, you know, um, being infected, et cetera, right? And patients could talk to the loved one without going in the room, right? So I did say then, in two years, three years ago, that the name HALT, High and Low Technology, is not a good name. <laughs> I last year in November, I said, I did say that, and I don't have goat mouth. That halt is not a good name, and the project halted. <laughs> I was kind of taking the time to say, no, the project halted, man. We just, it, it finishes it. <laughs> you know, the robots coming, but I, I guess, you know, the robots taking the time coming. It's over a year now, right, Gerald? How, over a year? So these are things, how can we progress? I mean, so anyway, let me stop there, right? <laughs> so to that situation, right? Um, the, I think HRMIT, I want this human resource association looking at um, a system to provide appointments for booking and these sort of things. But, but, but um, you know, you, you know what sort of um, secretaries do now, right? And they're trying to collect data for predictive wealth for health policy. The head ministry has said that they have funded the digitalized records. So when you get sick in Montu, you don't have to send your records in, in, in Santa Grande Hospital that comes the next day. So you know, physicians will have the records in your hand. But that is happening. Finance, I know, I mean, I know for a fact that I asked, you know, uh, for the public, uh, for citizens mark, they have a chat point. When you ask questions uh, on um, uh, What's up? It responds to you and gives you sort of answers and so that it's a chat. So it's been used, AI, there, right? I tried to get information from the finance people 
for fraud detection. So I just got a general answer. Yes, we are looking at this, but they don't want to use specific. And naturally, so, so somewhat has been done in the finance sector, all right? Um, I just try to find what's the status in China. TT Connect, all right? The intention is to have this similar kind of chat box for helping citizen you know, delivery. That's the intention, right? In academia, I mean, that people I know at the MME department and completes the research and good research also, other departments are looking at also, right? You will, something has taken place to exactly what I'm not too sure, right? Uh, so it's happening, but overall, when you look at the situation in Trinidad, not much has happened. That's reality. In terms of legislation, historically, Trinidad has been very, uh, our legislation for technology issues, very, very poor. And now of AI, you need a lot more. So I don't know how that's going to go, because you need it, right? So AI is here to stay. It provides a powerful tool to enhance industry, commerce, education, etc. Can we use it or not? We have some requirements, as I pointed out earlier. Legislation and uh, regulations need to be there for AI. And I guess that is even a worse state than the application. Even for existing technologies for a long, long time, existing we have gotten things like you know data privacy actually proclaim, etc. It's not there. And in the end, social vigilance is needed. Because like I said, it affects everything. In news you get, everything it affects how you think. And in fact, in the USA, they seem to think that democracy is being subverted by AI. Yeah, this is something we have to be vigilant of. So social vigilance is the you know absolute need. So I thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Bussard, for that wonderful lecture. At this time, we will um, take our questions from our audience. So we will do it uh, in phases. So we'll take from our physical audience, and then we'll go online. So anybody in our physical audience would like to pose a question? Hi, bro. Um, thanks for the lending um, lecture. You would have mentioned at the start that a big problem we have in Trinidad and Tobago is access to data sets to train AI. But if we have to develop a strategy to eventually get there, how do you think our resources should be placed? And is it worth pursuing or should we just wait until the systems are developed elsewhere and implemented? Why is it hard question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I don't think we have access. All these things are stored in databases in, in, elsewhere, right? Whether we will have access to that is a different issue. But there are some applications, you get the software right, for instance, that I'll give an example which might be, and again, this is purely academic. Let's look at crime. Crime data is here, it's not in the USA, right? You look at, you observe um, casually how criminals operate. A gang comes in area A and terrorizes the people and then moves off. Area B. Now, if we start putting these things in place, you know, into a system, we can start detecting trends. We, we can use it. Eh? So I would think one of the present problems that we have is that, and that we have data, we can you can look at it. And in fact, I did a project way back. Let me look at break-ins. And the police have detailed data on break-ins, you know. Every area, what time the break-in took place, etc. Detailed data. Is it being used? I think it's been used to break it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it is not there. It's not, so, so we have some areas in which critical areas are unique to us, but you can use data and look at trends and use AI software to help in that, or develop some AI software, because you have sort of generic software you can put in and develop. Thank you, Professor Bussard, for that is the UTT currently engaged in having a discussion with regards to how we can develop these softwares, these um, um, AI platforms to be used by, let's say, industry? Well, I give some examples where we had the, the decision support system. It's there, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the industry chose not to use it. Eh? Actually, we are making better progress on now they seem to understand that getting the university involved because I think the their their general view, particularly the local sort of owners of industries, so, hey, 
Firstly, if it's working, no question. Right? Secondly, let's talk to people abroad to do it. Now, the thing I, we have been asking, but at least when you're doing that, let us be involved in that so we gain experience. To, 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 so I build that confidence. I think that's more amenable now. But we won't be building any significant um, sort of uh, use software. We use existing software to build databases. Right? And there's a big need for it. Prof, um, I just want to circle back to AI in education. Uh, you did mention um, perhaps a paradigm shift in your contribution in education. Given that the half-life of knowledge is less than four years, because knowledge is not just finite, it's also very shareable today. And in some tech disciplines, the half-life is even two and a half years. The traditional bachelor's program in higher ed is roughly four years. Are we supporting an absolute obsolescence industry? And what are your thoughts on how this should be unfolding going forward? Other than have less replaced. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what I said initially, right? That don't focus on you know, the, the, the knowledge per se. Focus on the use of knowledge. So when the knowledge changes, you know how to use it then. And I think that really, and it has to start from the primary school. It can't start from university. And that requires a huge paradigm shift. I don't know who's going to do that. And how are you going to teach teachers to do that then? Eh? So, but that is something we need to do uh, in terms of being agile. I don't think we, we are known for being agile. Eh? So, but that is, I think that's come going to haunt us eh? as we go forward. No doubt about that. I hope that answers <laughs> the Does the university have a mandate with regards to the use of AI in education, seeing that we have the Bachelor of Education programs in our um, offerings. Well, we have both man data and woman data also. But, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the, what the, we go through normal process, eh? that you have the, um, in terms of ACT team, right? you, you have to have your program done every five years, eh? do it, right? And talk to the stakeholders, etc. cetera. Uh, that still is, is a slow process. I, I'm not criticizing anybody. I mean, like we have applied for, permission to use online program, fully online. We have to get approval of ACTT. Some of this thing going on for years. They've indicated they don't have expertise to judge if you can teach online. So there, there, there is a issue, you know, there's a huge issue here of, of also of, of resource and talent. Eh? But also I think we have to ask ourselves whether we, there's a general sort of high inertia to change. Yes, sir. You made the point that, um, and I agree with uh, licensing fees for software going, going up. We have to renew it in consulting services. It is quite likely that clients may expect their fees, their, their, the fees for their services to go down. I don't know if you agree with that, but how should the consulting firm pitch their fees relative to what is likely to happen? Would the fees go down? Would the fees go up? And how would the services, how are the services likely to be affected? Do you, do you agree with what I've said in the first place with the client expecting the fees to go down? Well, naturally, so people want to pay less and less, right? For more and more, right? But the, I think it's policy. The, the, we had this big data conference, which is a plan was there, and I said, look, we had to be smart about it. I mean, that turned out, and I, I gave the example that. Uh, let's look at banner software. UV has banner, they pay for it themselves, right? Costa has banner, pay for themselves, right? Every, I'm saying time comes now, the, you know, the, the governments are dealing with tech companies. They say, look, we want a license for the country. That's going to cut the, the, the fee down big time. And then it, it can be passed on to the, the, 
the consumers, right? including like consultant people, your fees will be less, right? I mean, if you get together and say, we're going to use software, right? What particular software you're going to use, whatever civil software, or great design, et cetera, right? You can look at these things to get, you know, a, a reduction. But that again calls for some kind of policy. And like I say, I mean, these software people, I think they're, you know, the green seems to have gotten the best of them and they just push at it all the time. Eh? So maybe you can, the firms can start talking <laughs> no matter what happened. You should do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only issue with data is once you have digital data and you expose your digital data, people as a, as a fear, there's a fear that um, it's expensive to develop or pay to capture the digital data. And when they release it, there are nothing coming back to them. You understand and people could could make um uh large profits from their data. So twenty years ago when I did my when I was in university, um, a postgraduate, um somebody doing postdoctoral work came down and he was surprised that ministries in government wouldn't share their data among themselves. Right? This is ministry to ministry. And we're not talking about ministry to the public sector or universities. Because in the states at that point in time, it was happening. So how do we convince people that sharing their data could result in some benefit to them economically at a later point in time? Let me consider it in, in a larger sort of philosophical thing. I was involved in a committee. I can see how the committee looked like ICT Toronto. Yes. We were asking them, why does every ministry have its own card? We point out in there with 1.4 billion people got this sort of card, social security type card, and everything. All the people very quickly. But for now, every man is an island to himself. <laughs> and that's the problem we have. So people don't, you know, see the overall good. They see, you know, the immediate sort of position they have, etc. Right? But if we start doing that. The other thing is what is strange. My experience is that I was a commission report in late 80s, early 90s. I know how many people remember the panorama, the boat, you had a problem with you couldn't reverse the shaft, right? So I I called in some engineers from TN Tech, right? Because of routine equipment, we did some measurements. Uh, when we looked at the, the, I was told that people from Lloyd's came down and did some work on the on the ship. So I asked, where is the where is the result? Where's the data? That they took, right? This report. I was told, no, we get them back that one. I said, why? They said, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> and so, this is sort of, I, I don't know if you understand this. So, even right now, when we use things, people get our data and keep it abroad. So, we may not want to share it with each other, but people abroad have it there eh? and send it to us. Okay, we have just in case you see some politician call and say you have to put it here. You will answer, yeah. Somebody on Zoom wants to know how can AI be adapted for education? Because students are already using it. How are we to decide what trustworthy sources, citations, and critical thinking? Well, we need to let them use it and we need to penalize them rather than check what was the result. <laughs> So, so don't penalize them for using it. No, no, let them no, use no. it. Right. But penalize them for not using it well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that would lead to actually a policy on the use of AI. Because I'm pro AI for using chat GPT and all of these things, right? It, it's a good starting point for many assignments where students may store, mm -hmm. but the cross referencing, just as you would do with any kind of secondary source of information you have to cross-reference, you have to check credibility and so forth. So it's really the practice that is not old. But where's the policy for the use of AI with us? There should be no, is there a policy that you use a calculator? No, but it's not a calculator, we use it, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's it's, a, it's in a broader context. You're not going to use it just for mathematical calculations. You're using it for quite a number of things. So my thing is you can't stop using Let people use it, but penalize them for not understanding how to use it. And be lazy, and be plagiaristic. You see, you're doing two things there. One is that 
encouraging use of technology, which we must do. Secondly, you want to make sure that they have rhythm in what they do, so you double check. And I think so it will be a blessing in disguise. Instead of copying or you know, taking, right now people pull things wholesale from the net. Chat mm -hmm. GPT actually suffer for them, but let them check it and penalize them heavily. But AI has has fallen, has made tremendous progress in its applications to data answers. But from a pedagogical standpoint, it, it has fallen short on educational measurement. And we're using in classrooms, and I'm just talking about the sectors as a whole, we're using a top-notch technology, but judging it on all methods of measurement. What do you mean? We're judging the student. That is technology. Because what other technology you have? Way back, you know, you have these big fat books with abstracts. When you do your research long time, you're like, well, you know, what now you can do is faster, you have online stuff, etc. So we have to encourage people to use technology, but we have to ensure the rhythm is there. So I don't, I, I, I don't, I mean, tell them not to use it is repressive. Judge them on, on, on what they, how they use it and whether they, they use it the right method, like it's check-in, not cross-reference, etc. That is really what they need to do in real life. That, that, that would be my approach. I just like, you know, like telling people, you know, I remember when we started to get everybody getting computers at UE, they found that, you know, the pornographic sites you know, had endless traffic. So the approach the technician to find everybody when you see computers. So, no. Right? <laughs> Found these sites, <laughs> and that worked better. That's what I'm saying. So you should take a repressive policy. You should okay. Okay. more targeted, you know. So. so what my question is the ethics, right? So if I go on ChatGPT and I ask it to, I don't know, generate an email response to something, can I just cut that and paste it and say it's mine, or I cut the whole thing and paste it and say that's ChatGPT, <laughs> or do I edit it and is that Ethical. What you say, like the, the in research papers, right? You have to indicate that you, you know, how you're giving references. You use ChatGPT, right? Mm -hmm. And because of the the it's, um, it's proved errors, right. you need to check, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of attribution, I think it's important that life is about attribution. A society doesn't understand the concept of attribution, short of faith. Especially in academia, attribution it should be a fundamental you know, practice. Unfortunately, a lot of times that's not the case. But you should state it. But you know, news quite some time now, in other newspapers, especially abroad, is done by uh, AI systems. Eh? Yeah. But even some institutions now require you to put your prompt mm -hmm. in the reference list. Huh? Yeah. But that's an attribution. You need to attribute. Correct. That's correct. Yes. Yes. You can always blame the AI if it went wrong, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's where you got it from. So at least you give credit. Yeah. Yeah. So just one other question, Prof. Uh, so we are focused on the technology a lot and the ethics. But do you feel that enough work is being done on the social impacts? Because this is going to be an extremely disruptive technology on the social impacts that will come and have been coming. That is something that is difficult because people are saying that, eh? that they, you know, they, they, these fake news things are I think particularly, like I said earlier, that people think it's a threat to democracy, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I tell people, you know, I, I, I give an example, right? I'm prone to, you know, making uh, detailed intelligent uh, comments, right? That you have Valentine Day, right? You have Valentine Day, do you know that? Yeah, yeah, God, we didn't know that. So he lives on Valentine's <laughs> Day. So uh, people say, I need no partner from the other side. I'm fine. They meet together. Check it out, Valentine, right? But I was suggesting we have Valentine's Day. When you have some bad partners or former partners. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you can use chat. You know, <laughs> let them open. <laughs> No, but that's not my, but that has happened right now anyway. There people are circulating all sort of, you know, un, unsavory stuff. And that is a real problem. We, 
going to have it. How you deal with that? Because uh, everybody wants to get Facebook and let everybody know where they are, what they're doing, and every single time. I don't know why, <laughs> but we got this away, right? The people, the technology is not bad. Is the people bad? <laughs> How you deal with people? I, I, that, that is the issue. And you can't legislate everything, you cannot. Prof, looking ahead, let's, let's look around the corner before we reach there. Looking ahead, just, just share what, what you think uh, we are expected to see or experience around the corner before we reach there. Going, going forward. In the future, yeah, going forward. For that, I think... Well, well, globally first and then here. Yeah. Well, I can speak over here first. <laughs> but I think we're going to be left behind more and more. Yeah, you're correct. We're going to become irrelevant more and more. I, I think the world is, is the, the world is changing big time. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, use technology becomes a part of real life. From war, I guess, and you look at drones now, right? Yeah. And then yeah. soldiers are coming next, etc. Right? Robotic soldiers. Where are we? How do we cope with it? Look at the manufacturing industry. Where, where are we going to go? In fact, we have been asking how long now to do a survey of the state of the manufacturing industry with regard to automation and AI. It's it, it like the robotics project from Paho. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, so why the world goes ahead, yeah? We are watching. So, but it's, the world is going to change. I mean, you look at the changes already, right? Things like visa, people know who you are before you go on the plane. So they are moving ahead, utilizing technology at a very fast pace, right? The Americans in particular. I mean, I'll give you an example. I came from London uh, in, in, last year, whenever. All over your book and your custom form online. And you land through the other floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have the machine, sir. So, you know, how we have the technology, this is something I, I, I don't know, right? I mean, even, even like education, why are students are given computers right through with good Wi Fi? At the university, you have difficulty getting Wi Fi, good Wi Fi, which we hope to change, right? No, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not making, you know, and this, these are facts, yeah? And at the university, it's important in companies to speak the truth. <laughs> okay, I'll share one of the comments from Zoom. What is it, Jillian? <laughs> 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 We need students to focus on higher order thinking, higher order skills like critical thinking and analysis, rather than spending copious amounts of time looking for information which can be efficiently done by AI. Another person is Trisha Reddy. She says we can use the CRAAP test, C-R-A-A-P test. It's an acronym for currency relevance or authority, accuracy, and purpose. So we can use that test to evaluate our sources. And uh, and that's pretty much it from online. A, a lot of the comments are really long. So I will be sharing. So much in here. You want? You can throw it, you can send it in privately. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's a serious fear. I can read that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I give an example. You know, I was 24 when my head of the department, then I page at Julie asked me to join the, 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 the faculty as a teacher. And I asked him, well, you know, what is teaching at university? If you heard it before, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I he asked him, what is this about? He said, university of seeking the truth. I said, well, I've come from a long line of pundits, I understand that. So I want to teach at university. So that's what I said, university, be seeking the truth, speak the truth. That's what we need to do. We have future, you know, university trains future leaders, yeah. right? And if you cannot speak the truth, see things as they are, how are we going to change? So th th this is something that, you know, I, I think, and the other thing is that the people think that the engineers, you know, Tambo, so quiet and do your work, you know, do your formula, and you don't comment on nothing else. We are human beings too. We live in society too. Why would you be stupid? You must have a view. So 
So I'm not saying to politicize your know, engineering work, but your engineering work has political implications. It's not so. And you have to be aware of that and stand up for that. That's my view. Professor, one of the things that stood out for me in your presentation, when you looked at the impact of AI on industry, there was a conversation had with the way things are going with regards to people, creatives like photographers, artists, models, videographers, being replaced by AI. You know, you don't need a model posing or, or, or displaying something again. AI can do these images, right? How do you think this would impact earning potential and let's say the, the, the economy really um, from that perspective, earning potential? But to take a step back, right? I mean, before you had tractors, came from our granted area, you have to take a whole and all the time, and make banks, etc. Now we go back. Machinery came in and made life easier. Right? Now what we say as you go for like in automation, right? Uh, as you go as, as you adopt technology, some people lose jobs. And that, that is unfortunate, eh? But then society must say, hey, the gain we get in that, that was compensated. Uh, a simple example like the oil move or whatever, you know, from oil and gas. Usually you've been far from there for society. So so it doesn't stand in, in, in isolation that you're going for an automation and people lose a job and it's too bad for them. If you do use automation, you should be making more money, the companies, the taxation, etc. and you must have a social net. But that is government policy. And we cannot, like I said, we cannot hold back focus. People pass us, reference them. If you, if you read, let me just share this. If you just read The Future of Jobs 2023, just recently published, it's really about 85 million jobs will be lost, but 97 will be created, uh, which alludes to the evolutionary process of, of obsolescence and new things coming. It's fact of life. You reskill. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. But that again is policy, right? The people must do, must do that. Eh? So. Okay, so I want to thank you all for participating in that excellent and engaging discussion. So this concludes our question and answer segment for today. At this time, we would like to present our speaker with a token of appreciation. So I invite Ms. Nini Rambasad Archie of the PMCS Department to the elective to present our token of appreciation. Professor Sad, on behalf of the PMCIS unit, we would like to thank you for that enlightening and informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I hope this is a AI. At this time, we'd have, we'd have um, a company feature by Ms. Aruna Bradley. Good afternoon. While UTT supports the industry by producing grad aids, the industry also supports us in numerous ways. We are grateful for those companies that have partnered with us over the years and have exercised their corporate social responsibility. Today, I want to highlight one of PMCIS's dedicate, dedicated industry partners, Profilable Limited. They have hosted our students with multiple field trips to their construction factory, and have supported us in our student orientation program. We are immensely grateful to them for their continued support. Now let us watch their promotional video so you can understand who they are and what they do.
So at this time, I would like to invite Dr. Charlie to the closing remarks. <laughs> So I will have noticed a little bit, a little bit of AI at work there in that company. It's very relevant. Uh, so when we started to this distinguish, these distinguished lectures, Professor Street has always said, uh, with a very um, kind of hostile voice. You ever listen to them people who call it in a radio station? So his position is that most of them are not really, um, or should not be calling and driving a conversation. We in the academic university, in the academic environment, should be driving the conversation as to what has happened. We should dictate what we are speaking about or what we are talking about. So this is our intention with these distinguished lectures. We had done work on the congestion and the transportation in the country. And that day when we had that presentation, it didn't start until about quarter to seven. Because the president, the presenter, <laughs> was, caught, was caught in a two to three hour. He left at three o'clock in the Gomata and he didn't reach here until minutes to seven. So it was very significant, this lecture. And it was also very relevant on that day. Um, so that was our position at that point in time. So then we talked about AI, and a lot of people said it was also timely because, as Professor would have indicated, is that if we are not careful, we will be left behind, right? So I know there's a lot of fear by some because it's very difficult for us to assess um, the interaction or the contributions of AI in, us, in education. But we have to, um, to remove that fear really and develop a sense of, um, as well, we have to remove that fear first of all and try to realize that AI is here to stay and we must, we must learn to adapt. And we have to. We need to take our heads out of the sand and look at it. Because this has been here, this professor has been doing it for the last 25 years. And it's here, it's now at a very intense state, you know, because now it's in our classrooms. We have to deal with it. GMCIS also, as you see, have been engaging with the industry. So it's our hope that with that engagement, our partners are able to give us some ideas as to where the, the direction of the university or our unit should go when it comes to research and development. We would also like to thank, thank Profilbo today, but we also have companies like Alice Conrady Mix, CMEX Limited, who has always been supporting us, um, Aleron, and Hafiz Karama. These are, oh, and CPML. These are companies who have stood by, stood by our side. We are happy that we were able to, um, to display one of the videos today. And as we continue with our distinguished lecture, we will showcase more of our partners and give them an opportunity to display to not only to the world, but also to our students more critically, the linkages that our unit and our university has made with the industry. Um, as, I, as I close again, I want to thank everyone for attending and thank Professor Passard for his very enlightening lecture. And thank you also for contributing to these lectures. As we bring the curtains down on this distinguished lecture, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who made it a huge success. Firstly, I would like to thank Professor Passard for sharing his knowledge expertise and insights and giving up his Wednesday afternoon with his <laughs> grandkids to spend with us. I would also like to talk, thank the Office of the President for supporting our distinguished lecture series. Next, I would like to thank our founder, Professor Sweet. Unfortunately, he has COVID and he was unable to come today, but he has kept us motivated to continue to foster intellectual discourse within our department. In addition, I would like to thank all the other departments at UTT that continue to collaborate and cooperate with us to make these lectures successful. In no particular order, I would like to thank Corporate Communications, TLIS, Interactive Media, Audiovisual, IT, Campus Management, PMCIS, and Outreach and Industry Relations. Lastly, I would like to thank you, our attendees, for clearing your busy schedules to spend your 
evening with us either physically or virtually. I hope that you all have been enlightened and enriched. And remember, it is said that knowledge shared equals knowledge squared. Please stay tuned to our social media pages for information about our future distinguished lectures. And from our team here at UTT, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.